thank you for um, uh, having me here with uh, this amazing set of people. It's been just an incredible symposium. So um, uh, what I would like to do is uh, share some thoughts with you. And as Richard pointed out, I've, I've changed this, uh, this talk uh, probably 20 times in the last couple of days. So um, as you know, it's, it has a different title than what I promised at the beginning. Uh, what I'm working on, among other things, is a framework which I call TAME, T-A-M-E, Technological Approach to Mind Everywhere. And the goal of it is to be able to recognize, create, and relate to truly diverse intelligences, regardless of their composition or origin story. And this includes familiar creatures, of course, uh, uh, various unusual colonial swarms, synthetic biology like these uh, xenobots that you're seeing here in the um, lower right-hand corner. Uh, various AIs, whether so software or hybrid, and of course, possible exobiological agents. And uh, what I would like the framework to do is to move experiments forward. So not just philosophy, but to actually suggest uh, specific research agendas. Now, clearly this is, uh, I'm, I'm not the first person to try for such a thing here is um, uh, Wiener et al in, uh, in the, uh, 1943 had, had a uh, very cybernetic kind of uh, uh, scale um, like this. Um, but in fact, it goes even, even further back and this is a well-known painting uh, called um, Adam Naming the Animals um, in the Garden of Eden. And uh, this, this painting is really interesting. It, it gets one thing deeply wrong and then gets something else deeply right. What it gets wrong, I think, is uh, this notion of sharp categories, this idea that there are sort of dis discrete natural kinds, discrete species that, uh, that, that, that we can identify. And um, I'll, I'll talk about that momentarily. What I think it gets really correct is that uh, and, and this has been discussed by, by scholars, is that Adam had to name the animals, not God, not the angels. It was up to Adam to uh, specifically name these animals and, and naming them means discovering their true nature. And I think this capability is going to come in very handy in the uh, coming uh, decades because all of Darwin's endless forms, most beautiful, all of the varieties of natural life is a little corner here of this enormous state space that uh, consists of every kind of possible combination of evolved material, design material, and uh, software. So hybrids, uh, cyborgs, uh, various kinds of uh, chimeras, and so on. All of these things are possible, and um, we, need to, we need to discuss uh, today about wh why it is that, that all of these are, are, are viable and, and, and interesting. And so uh, it, you know, a, lot of, a lot of philosophy and, and such uh, centers around this, this idea of kind of a standard adult modern human but um, this thing is, uh, is, is not a discrete category. In fact, it's a, it's a spot on a continuum along a couple of different dimensions. So of course the evolutionary scale where, where we used to be uh, unicellular microbes and uh, de the developmental time scale, uh, similar kind of thing. And then there's this sort of uh, perpendicular scale where both along biological and technological dimensions, you can imagine making small changes until you've got something that's actually quite different. And the reason this is all possible is because life is incredibly interoperable. And so at every level at the cell, the, you know, DNA cells, tissues, organisms, and so on, you can replace uh, the natural components with various other things, again, be they uh, biological or um, designed by us. And so this has some interesting implications. Um, I tend to think that uh, developmental biology is, is sort of the, the queen of all sciences. And that's because uh, sort of uniquely in this, in this example, what you get to see in front of your very eyes is how physics becomes mind. So we all start um, as, uh, as a little blob of uh, quiescent uh, materials. This is an oocyte, unfertilized oocyte. And slowly, gradually uh, through a regulative process, uh, we go from being what some people call, and I, I don't like this term, but some people say, well, that's just physics and chemistry. Um, but, but very slowly that turns into something like this or possibly even something like this. And uh, of course, intelligence in this process doesn't wait until we get up here. So even individual cells um, have molecular networks that can do interesting things like associative learning and, 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 and various other things. And so one, one of the fundamental facts about us is that we are uh, collective intelligence is we are made of things like this. This is that lacrimaria that uh, many people like to show. It's a, it's a, it's a remarkable uh, single cell, um, uh, no brain, no nervous system. But what it's very good at is managing single cell level goals. So, so if you think about the cognitive light cone of the largest goal that this thing can pursue, it's metabolic states and, and, and various um, uh, physiological states are roughly at the level of a single cell. Now, what evolution uh, has, has done is provide it with some hardware 
where a variety of uh, body cells can, can get together and form networks that can pursue much larger goals in, in different problem spaces. And so when I say goal, I'll, I'll, I'll describe uh, in, in more detail in a minute what I mean, but fundamentally the idea that this is a, this is a salamander limb. If you amputate uh, anywhere along, the per, along this axis, the cells will build exactly what they need, which is this other salamander uh, replica, and then they stop. And they stop when they get to this region of anatomical morphous space. And so, the, and, and you can continue to, uh, to do this and they will keep doing it. And so, and so evolution has scaled up the, um, the, the, the sort of goal directedness of, uh, of these subunits, but that uh, process has a failure mode and that's known as cancer. So this is glioblastoma cells, um, which have basically reverted back to their uh, individual single cell level goals, because one of the first things that happens during cancerous transformation is that cells disconnect electrically from their neighbors. And so, so um, they are no longer part of this electrical network that remembers what a limb is supposed to be. And at that point, uh, they just revert back to their uh, unicellular um, kind, of, uh, kind of form. And the idea is, you know, many people uh, model cancer using game theory and things like this as, as a more selfish cell. And I'd like to propose that it isn't any more selfish. It's just that it's, the self is smaller in this case. It's, it's exactly as selfish as, as this other collective, but the boundary between self and world has scaled down. And these kind of ideas have very practical implications because here in our, uh, we, we have a, a good chunk of our lab does a kind of regenerative medicine. And so what we can do is we can in inject human oncogenes into these tadpoles. First thing they do is they cause a depolarization of the cells. You can see that here on a voltage dye. They, they disconnect from the rest of the uh, body and they basically uh, undergo tumor genesis and then metastasis. They basically uh, treat the rest of the body as just external environment. And so we can prevent this not by killing off the cells and uh, not by fixing the mutation, but actually, and, and here, in fact, the oncoprotein here is, is blazingly expressed very strong all throughout, but there's no tumor there because what we've done is co-inject an ion channel that uh, controls the voltage and doesn't let them uh, disconnect despite what the genetics say. So, so this layer of, of physiological control is very strong. It sits between them and with the many examples that I can't, uh, don't have time to show today, that sits between the, the genomic specification of the hardware and the actual form and function that, um, that results. So these, these ideas have very practical implications and we're now moving towards the clinic in the case of uh, glioblastoma in, in human cells. Uh, I, I, I would like to think that um, uh, one of the most uh, uh, fundamental aspects of this, which is, which is this idea of where does the self end and the outside world begin, right? This, this, this setting of boundaries. Um, I would like to think that uh, Turing actually was well, already saw something very important here, which is that you know he was of course very interested in uh, artificial in, in, in intelligence in broad terms and various embodiments, but he also uh, did this this um, this amazing paper on the basis of morphogenesis, and I think it's because he saw this this very deep symmetry between questions of the construction of minds and the construction of bodies. And let me just show you one quick example of what I mean by this. Uh, here is a, a, a little piece of an embryonic blastoderm, lots of cells, let's say 50,000 cells at this stage. And we tend to look at that and we say, there's an embryo, one embryo. What are we counting when we look at 50,000 cells and we count one embryo? Well, what we're counting is alignment. What we're counting is the fact that left to its own devices, these cells will not only physically align, which they, they do, but actually uh, they will also align in their actions in anatomical morphous space. They will all co uh, co cooperate with each other to build this very particular kind of um, structure. And um, we, we actually wouldn't, wouldn't be able to predict that in advance if we, hadn't, uh, if we didn't already know what embryos were any more than we can look at a brain and if we didn't know what, what a human was, we could look at a human brain, and ask the question for that amount of substrate, how many cells fit in there? What, what is the density in this medium of, uh, of, of individuals per, per unit medium? And that's because this, uh, both brains and, uh, and, and embryonic structures are um, dynamic with respect to the uh, autopoiesis of cells. And so what you can do in this blastoderm is you can make little scratches here, I did this as a grad student, make a little scratch in a uh, duck, um, duck blastoderm. What happens is when you make little scratches, each of these regions uh, basically uh, thinks they're alone. They don't feel the others. And so they self-organize into an embryo. And eventually when it heals, you get, this, uh, you get these conjoined twins or triplets and so on. Uh, in fact, when you do this, these embryos, there's a little disputed zone between them where these cells aren't quite sure which embryo they belong to. This is why human conjoined twins, one of them often has laterality defects because is this my right side or is this my left side and so on. But the, the, the important thing here is that um, 
these uh, the, the the number of cells or, or individuals in an embryo is not genetically determined. The default is one, but actually it could be anywhere from zero to probably half a dozen or more individuals that could form out of that. And so this this uh, this, this 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 has to um, uh, the, the, these these boundaries between each uh, each individual, uh, both developmentally and then uh, cognitively, uh, are are dynamic. And so. This, this, of course, is also an issue in the brain in terms of uh, you see this with split brain patients and various dissociative disorders and so on. So that boundary between cells in the medium is, is, is important. So um, in my group, we're really interested in this idea that uh, all the way down through biology, uh, there's this multi-scale competency architecture, this idea that uh, it's not just a nested uh, set of uh, dolls that are structurally, but also in terms of competencies in different spaces. And we're pretty good, not, not great, but we're, we're, we're pretty good at recognizing intelligence in three-dimensional space, so traditional behavior, but we're really still not very good at recognizing it in other problem spaces. So the ability to navigate uh, uh, with, with, um, with various adaptive competencies, transcriptional space, physiological state space, and what I'm gonna spend the rest of the time talking about, which is um, anatomical morphospace. space. And one hypothesis that we've been pursuing is that what evolution does is pivot some of the same tricks through different problem spaces, all the way up to linguistic space. And we have some projects on that. And we can actually see how some of these uh, basic strategies uh, are, are, are rotated through these different spaces. Now, uh, I've, I've used various, various words uh, such as intelligence, and it's time to uh, give a definition. So, so I like William James's definition, which is the ability to reach the same goal by different means. And so what this emphasizes, it's, it's, it's very nice. It's very also kind of uh, cybernetic. It doesn't say anything about brains or, or evolutionary origin story or anything like that. But what it emphasizes is intervention. So you can't just judge this by observation. You have to, you have to do perturbative experiments. And you have to measure the competency to overcome various perturbations in some problem space. So two magnets faced with a little piece of wood between them are never going to do anything more interesting than stand there pressed up against the, the wood. They don't have the, the wherewithal to temporarily move away and then uh, rejoin each other on the other side. But um, Romeo and Juliet can, and this is actually the example that James gives, the difference between magnets and Romeo and Juliet. But it forms a continuum in between. You have all sorts of autonomous vehicles, uh, various biological cells, uh, worms and, and everything else that has different degrees of the ability to do that. So this is what I mean by intelligence, the ability to, to, to problem solve in the face of perturbations. And of course, uh, the space they're working with in the goal and the degree of intelligence you observe is observer dependent. It's, that, that's us taking an IQ test every time we make a model of this for some system. We may not be smart enough to recognize it. And one particular kind of collective intelligence that I think is, is highly underrated is that um, uh, deployed by cellular swarms during morphogenesis. So let's, let's talk about that. This is, this is how we, we begin life as a bunch of uh, uh, embryonic blastomeres. And then this is a cross section through a human torso. So uh, look, look at the amazing order that's here. All the all the, it's the cells, the tissues, everything is in the right place, the right uh, shape, or next to the right neighbors. Uh, where did this come from? And 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 of course, many people are tempted to say, "Well, it's in the it's in the DNA, of course." But it's not in. I mean, we can read genomes. We know what's in the DNA. It's it's protein sequences, the micro level hardware, and it's not directly in the DNA any more than the structure of these. Um, of uh, ant and termite mounds or the actual structure of the web made by the spider. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's the result of the behavior of physiological software that runs on this genomically specified hardware. And we would like to know how do these cells know what to build? How do they know when to stop? Uh, how do we repair this when something is, is damaged or missing? And as engineers, we'd also like to ask what's actually possible to build using the exact same genome. And so the, the, the current paradigm for this is that of emergence and complexity. So the idea is there are local rules, all of these cells follow, uh, follow these local rules, and eventually you sort of crank forward this, this feed forward process, and eventually something complex will come out. And I want to show you that that's only part of the story. Development is in fact quite reliable. So, so this, this, this kind of thing happens correctly most of the time, but it's actually not, it's not hardwired. It's, um, it's got all kinds of interesting competencies. For example, if you were to cut this embryo in half or even to more pieces, you don't get two half bodies, you get two perfectly normal monozygotic twins. So you start to get this idea that you can get to the same uh, ensemble of goal states, the target morphology from different, uh, different uh, starting positions. And one of the, one of the um, 
kind of wildest examples of that is something we discovered a few years ago, which are these, uh, we call them Picasso uh, tadpoles. So uh, these tadpoles uh, of the frog Xenopus levis here, are the eyes, here's the brain, the nostrils, they have to become a frog. And you would think that this could be a hardwired process. All tadpoles look the same, all frogs look the same. All the different pieces of the head need to do to, to turn a tadpole into a frog is move in a particular direction, a particular amount, and, and there you go. So we decided to test the hypothesis that this system actually had more intelligence than that. And what we did was we, we did the perturbation, which is to create a, a scrambled tadpole head. So the eyes on the back of the head, the jaws are off to the side, everything is scrambled like a, like a Mr. Potato Head doll. And what happens is that these animals become largely quite normal frogs because all the organs will move in novel paths. Sometimes they go too far and actually have to double back and then they make a correct frog and then they stop. So what the genetics actually gives you is a kind of error minimization scheme. It's a, it's a, it's a system that can recognize unexpected states and deal with them and take corrective action to get where it needs to go. Uh, of course, th these kind of uh, uh, anatomical homeostasis or, or even allostasis has different parts to it. You need to remember the set point, you need to sense what's going on at any given time, and then you need to actuate. So this, uh, this kind of uh, um, perception action loop is, 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 is really interesting. And I'm only gonna talk about one part of it, although we, we study all of these, the set point. How does this system, or in fact, any of these systems, know what the correct pattern is supposed to be. Is there some kind of a, a goal directedness in this in the cybernetic sense of remembering a set point with respect to which you're going to calculate error? So uh, we uh, with the, the, the place where we look for this is in bioelectrical networks. And that's because of course, uh, the brain is, is a great example of, a, of, a, of an electrical network that stores goal states and acts accordingly. So um, in the brain, what happens is that uh, you've got this, uh, this, this, this electrophysiology that controls muscles to move you through three-dimensional space. And uh, this, I, I think this whole uh, system um, basically developed from a far more ancient uh, use of the exact same set of tricks, which was uh, same, all, all, all the same kinds of um, uh, molecular mechanisms, uh, many of the same algorithms used to uh, make electrical networks that control all cells to move the configuration of the body in morphous space. It's so again, navigational task, uh, same thing. I wanna show you a couple of interesting examples. Um, this is a, this is a, a froglet uh, leg. What you'll see here is that when one of these uh, legs is amputated, there's a particular bioelectrical signal uh, that, that happens here. Within about 30 seconds, the opposite leg, which was never touched, lights up in exactly the same position. And in fact, from this signal, we could infer the location of the damage and the type of damage. So what we're talking about here is information flow between cells within an organism. What do the different parts of the organism uh, tell each other and what do they know about the, the, the state of the whole? This, by the way, is, uh, is, is also uh, a situation in the nervous system, for example, in um, epileptic mirror foci, that one hemisphere might have an electric uh, a focus of epilepsy, which is not damaged, mirroring the actual damage in the other side. Um, uh, this is, uh, you, can, uh, you, can, you can observe the cells actually uh, signaling here. Some, uh, these are some calcium waves in this frog embryo as it's uh, undergoing uh, neurulation. And with lots of interesting examples of, of cells c communicating to keep up this collective intelligence so that the whole thing can navigate the anatomical space properly. But it doesn't just work at the single cell level. It also works at the interorganism level. So what you can see here is that when we damage one of these, the calcium wave actually propagates through the medium. And these two guys find out that this one got pinched. It's actually a little forceps pinch here. And these two guys find out about it uh, very rapidly. Uh, and so th this kind of uh, multi-scale thing goes on all the time in, in biology. And this is not just uh, an epiphenomenon. This actually matters because if you expose embryos to a particular teratogen, and this is very new, uh, very new data, uh, what happens is that in small groups, it, they're, they're very um, highly affected, but the bigger you make the group, the better off they're going to be in resisting that teratogen, of course, having scaled the drug and, and the injections and everything else appropriately. Um, what happens is that collectives of embryos, this is not cells within an embryo, this is actual cohorts of animals, do better with morphogenesis by being in a group and being able to uh, resist these various uh, insults. And so there's all, all, all of this information transfer within animals in, in between uh, bodies is really critical to keeping up this, this, this business of collective intelligence. And the next thing I wanna show you is the memory. So, so if this is some sort of an agent that navigates space, can we, uh, can we see the memory? Can we, and, and better than just seeing it, could we rewrite it? And so this is our attempt in planaria. So in planaria, 
uh, they're, they're, they're highly regenerative, so you can chop off their head and tail, and this fragment knows exactly what a proper planarian is supposed to look like, and there it is, 100% of the time. Uh, but the, way, the reason it does that is because it has this bioelectrical gradient here, and what we can do in the meantime is perturb that gradient by using uh, ion channel drugs and, uh, and, and force it to be like this. This pattern is interpreted by the cells as two heads. Now, when you cut this animal, what they'll do is, this, this, this is the memory, the set point of what the cells are supposed to build if they are injured. So they go ahead and they build this two-headed animal. This is not Photoshop, these are real. Uh, but, but really important to note, this bioelectrical map is not a map of this animal. This is a map of this one-headed creature. So very much like in the nervous system, the same exact anatomy can hold one of two different representations of what it will do if it gets injured at a future time. And until it does that, the, the memory is latent. But if it does, uh, this is what it will build. So there's a dissociation between what's going on now and what you're going to do if, uh, if, if you get injured. And so this is, this is maybe one could hypothesize the beginnings of this amazing mental time travel that, uh, that, that complex brains are able to do in terms of memory prediction and so on. Now, I keep calling it a memory. Why? Because it meets um, all of the um, uh, criteria for memory. So it's long-term stable, because if I take these two-headed animals, I can continue to cut them. So uh, I cut off the primary head, I cut off the ectopic secondary head, and they will continue to generate two-headed animals in perpetuity. There's nothing genetically wrong with these animals. We haven't touched their genome. You can see them uh, You can see them here. And so the question of how many heads a planarian is supposed to have is tricky. It's not actually set in the genome. What the genome gives you is some hardware where the default is the, the, the bioelectric pattern memory that says one head, but it's reprogrammable. You can actually uh, give um, make it uh, do two heads, or you can take these and we can reset them back to being one-headed. So it's got long-term stability. It's rewritable as memory has to be. It's got a uh, conditional recall, as I just showed you, and some discrete behaviors. And this system is not just about uh, head number. It's also about head shape. So what we can do is take a nice triangular-headed um, Doratocephala, cut off the head, perturb the bioelectrical network, and they will generate, uh, some, they can generate the normal heads, but also round heads like this S. Mediterranea, or flat heads like this P. felina. So, and, and this extends not just to the shape of the head, but the, the shape of the brain and the distribution of the stem cells, just like these other species. Um, but 100 to 150 million years distance between these species and that species. And so what we can do is, is, is get the same hardware to visit attractors in anatomical state space that typically belong to other species. These other species go there naturally, but this hardware is perfectly happy to visit those attractors if the, if the bioelectrics uh, specify. You can go further than this and, uh, and actually make some really weird, uh, really weird shapes that don't look like planaria at all. And so these were basically prompted by a human uh, bioengineer, but nature does this all the time. The reason this works is not because we're all that clever. This works because uh, we think that this is how biology controls itself 24 seven. So here, here's an oak tree. Um, we know that uh, we, the, these acorns with their genome, they generate this flat thing, which is uh, it's green and it's flat and has very specific properties. But if you're hacked by a parasite, which is this wasp that basically prompts this tissue, it, it can actually visit very different regions of morphous basin and can make these spiky red things. It can make these. Th this is not the wasp making it. This is this is the plant. And we would actually have no idea that that this thing is capable of this kind of architecture if we didn't already see this this example. And 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 so and so it's very clear that we need to understand much better the latent morphous space, which I think Darcy Thompson already sort of uh, already, already knew about. Um, and understand how at different uh, scales, we can ask systems to navigate with, without having to re-engineer bottom up. And uh, I, think, I think the reason that this works is because in many ways, biology does not overtrain on its evolutionary prior. What it does is it plays the hand it's dealt. And what I mean by that is, here's one example. This has been known since the forties. This is a, uh, a, a, a cross section through the kidney uh, uh, a tubule of a newt, and typically, uh, typically newts have like eight or ten cells that work together to make this 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 uh, this tubule. But if you force the early uh, embryo to be polyploid, and you can get two n, four n, six n, and so on, what happens is the cells get bigger. That's pretty cool. The 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 actual uh, salamander stays the same size until you make really uh, gigantic cells, where now instead of using cell to cell communication, a different molecular mechanism is called up to reach the same anatomical outcome. This is a kind of top-down causation where here now cells use the cytoskeleton to bend around themselves, leaving an open hole in the middle. And these are five N newts. So if, if, if you're a salamander coming into this world, you can't depend on how, how many copies of genetic material you have. 
You can't depend on how big your cells are. You can't depend on how many cells you have. There are very, there, there, there's just all kinds of things that you cannot depend on, which means you have to figure this out from scratch with whatever you've got. This is not just plasticity. This is a kind of problem solving. And this is what allows planaria, which are highly regenerative, cancer resistant, immortal, and have a really, uh, really dirty genome because they reproduce by, by, by fission, at least our species does. And so they, uh, they, they keep and, and amplify every mutation that, that doesn't kill the stem cells. Their genome is a huge mess. And that's the animal with the, with the messiest genome that's actually has these amazing uh, features. And it's because, and these are, these are the simulations, evolution, uh, when, when you have an agential material like this that can solve problems, evolution spends most of its time optimizing the problem solving capacities, not the structural genome. And then actually a lot of the pressure on the quality of that genome is off, such as you see here. But in fact, you're able to hit very high fitness levels because of the competency of, of the material. And it's things like this, you know, if you make a tadpole and you prevent the primary eyes from forming, but you stick an eye on its tail, uh, the eye will make a single uh, optic nerve that will synapse on the spinal cord here. It doesn't go to the brain, it's, it, it stops right here. And these animals can see quite well. We train them for visual assays. Um, no, no new periods of evolutionary adaptation needed to this uh, uh, radically different uh, sensory motor architecture. They can see quite fine. They behave in these, in, these, um, in these assays. So the ability of the material to solve problems and, and, and handle novelty is, is, re is really critical. Um, here's one example. And I threw this in because uh, I wanted to uh, uh, talk for a minute about um, what uh, uh, Jim Shapiro was talking about and, and David's question about how cells know what to mutate. So in planaria, if you, if you hit them with a compound called barium chloride, it's a nonspecific potassium channel blocker. It, uh, it, it basically, uh, uh, a lot of the cells in the head are very unhappy. They, they, they explode. And so they, they just lose their heads. Their heads literally explode. Uh, but over the next couple of weeks, they regrow a new head that's totally barium adapted, has no problem with barium at all. And if you check transcriptionally what's different, it's only a handful of genes. Out of uh, between 10 and 20,000 genes, this system has identified just a handful that are required to solve this problem. I, and and uh, I think of it as being like in a nuclear reactor control room, you, the thing's melting down, you, you have you know, thousands of, of, of effectors that you can take, use to take steps in transcriptional space. But here's the kicker. Uh, planaria never see barium in the wild. As far as we know, there's never been uh, any kind of pressure for planaria to know what to do when they're hit with barium. So how do they find this? And we, we, don't, we don't know. Um, it, it could be generalization from, from uh, you know, epileptic seizures or something like this. But uh, what, this is, what, what I think this, this means is that if in fact cells do have the ability to work out the uh, credit assignment problem, or basically so solve that inverse problem of asking, which genes do I up and down regulate to solve a particular stressor, then that really does open the door to uh, either, either uh, natural or um, synthetically bioengineered strong Lamarckism, because that's the problem there is, is figuring out what gene would you, would you change to reach a particular uh, systems level um, outcome. And so the last, the last thing I just wanna say is this, this is a very old experiment uh, by McConnell. We reproduced it using modern methods, it does work. You can train planaria to recognize, in this case, uh, it's, it's place conditioning to recognize food in this bumpy little um, substrate, cut off their heads and brain. The tail sits there doing nothing for about 10 days, eventually grows back a new head, and these animals remember where the food was. And so what's important about this is not only that information is likely out, stored outside the brain, but that it has to be imprinted onto the new brain as it develops. And that planarian has to... Um, reconstruct its, its memories, given the uh, whatever molecular or, or uh, electrophysiological engrams are, are coming its way. It's a sort of like, um, uh, uh, it has to, uh, like, like, a, like an anterior grade uh, uh, amnesia patient, which, which, which has to figure out every day that they have to figure out from record, recordings they leave for themselves what's, what's going on. And I think one of the things we can, we can think about is that while this sounds really drastic and radical and different from, from, uh, from us, you know, we sort of tend to think of ourselves as these persistent selves with continuity of memories and so on. But I think we can actually, uh, so I'll just throw out this crazy idea. I think we actually are like these planaria in the sense that at any given moment, we don't have access to the actual past. What we have access to are the engrams left by things that have happened in the past. And I think we have to actively reconstruct this all, all the time. And so while planaria does this, you know, sort of in toto, I think we have to do it uh, c c continuously. And so this suggests this, this kind of view of selves as this um, 
uh, dynamic structure that's constantly constructing and reconstructing itself in these models of, of, of planaria and embryos and so on, I think have a lot to say about the philosophy of, of, of what we are and how we distinguish ourselves from the environment and where our borders are um, and so on. So I'll stop here and just thank the, uh, the people who did all the work. So these are the, uh, the postdocs and PhD students that did the work. Um, I wanna thank uh, our, our many, many collaborators. Many of you are, are here in this audience. Um, I wanna thank our funders uh, and, uh, and, and mostly the model systems because they do all the heavy lifting. So um, thank you for listening. Uh, are there questions after that really terrific talk? Questions? Yeah, there's a question from the chat, Michael. Um, hi, yes, yeah, so question from the chat. Um, it's a, kind of a, a longer question. Is there any regression to the mean if you repeat the two-headed uh, two experiment uh, long enough? Um, and then he goes kind of on to explain that in the famous Bayson and Sun and Born experiment in Paramecium, inverted rows could propagate, but only if they were selected every so often by the experimenter. Otherwise, all the cells eventually reverted back to the normal arrangement. And he um, kind of speculates, I was curious how general that phenomenon was. It might suggest a memory that requires periodic refresh like DRAM. Yes, super, super interesting question. So, so a few things that I know. Um, in fact, this is quite relevant to the Bayson and Sonnenborn experiments because the cytoskeleton is in fact remodeled in these worms. So, so that, that mechanism is similar. Um, I can't be sure that if we, if we did this for another 30 years that that wouldn't happen. All I can tell you is on the, on the scale that we've been looking at it, which is, you know, we cut the first two-headed worm in 2009. Um, and so since then, we haven't noticed anything like that. The, the rates uh, have, 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 pers you know, uh, have persisted, but uh, you know, yeah, exactly. 2053, we'll, we'll look at it again. It's, it's hard to know, but, but, I will say, but I will say this, this is, this is interesting. The two heads are permanently two headed as far as we can tell, they don't go back. The um, worms with the heads of other species, they do something quite interesting. They, within about seven, eight days, uh, they form the heads of these other species and they sit there that way for a few weeks. And then all of a sudden, they, something happens and they, uh, then they start to revert back. So those, those do in fact revert, that one, that one is not permanent. And we have another, another phenotype which sits there headless for six months and roughly between four, you know, somewhere between four and six months, they suddenly realize that something's wrong and they go back and they make a head. And that, that's always been interesting to me because I don't know what clock counts to six months. It's just such a weird, you know, such a weird time scale. But anyway. So, Mike, Mike a follow-up to that. Hmm. What, what's their behavior like for those six months without a head? Um, yeah, so, so without a head, planaria uh, have no initiative. So they sit there, they don't do anything. If you take a little pin and you poke them, they will sort of move out of the way, but they don't initiate anything. So they'll sit there, they don't, they don't eat, um, they just kind of hang out. Uh, oh. <laughs> uh, Pamela. Um, thank you, Mike. Um, given, given that set points are really important and this may be a ridiculous question given what you've just told us about the reversion in those other, in those other poor chimeric worms. Um, how do you operationalize? How are you operationalizing the whole notion of set point? How do you, how do you determine what a set point, how do you see a set point when you see, how do you know a set point when you see it? Yeah, yeah. Um, so to, to me, a set point is a state that uh, when you deviate the system from that state, it has some degree of uh, competency or ingenuity at getting back there. Sometimes very low, sometimes quite quite considerable. But what you'll see is you'll see the you'll see the system spending energy, avoiding barriers, going around uh, various uh, difficulties that you've uh, put in front of it to try to get back to that state. 
And so that suggests a set point, and then our goal is to try to find it. So I showed you one of the, one of the simplest ones we have with the, that we know about, which is how you encode the set point for the, for the number of heads. Um, there's another one that we know that's, that's quite, uh, quite um, uh, obvious, which is we call it the electric face. It literally, it's, an, it's a pattern of bioelectrics that tells you where the organs in the face go. And then there are lots of other patterns that we haven't decoded yet, and we don't, we, we just don't know how to how to decode them. This is a, a very long term uh, project to, to decode this uh, this stuff. Uh, other questions? Yeah. So I I just like to end with you know I I <laughs> I've come to the same conclusion about self that you know the idea that we are coherent people uh, with set desires and goals is a lie that our brain tells us uh, to try to make sense of all the individual uh, demands of our of all the cells in our body and that gives us coherent behavior and you know occasionally that breaks down and then we have psychiatric disorders but uh, otherwise we're it's a it's a fiction you know really yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't, um, you know, what, what I don't uh, really go for is, is the idea that it's, a, that, that it's an empty fiction, right? That, that there's literally nothing there. I'm not, I'm not sure that's true. I think, I think it's not what we take it to be. I think there's a lot of fictional elements, but only in the same way that many other concepts in science are fictions. I mean, it's a, it's a, good, it's a, it's a, it's a good working model of uh, how to live life and... Uh, you know, I think uh, I think it has lots of uh, lots of things to to offer. I I just think we're a lot more um, dynamically constructed than than we think. But I don't. But I don't think we don't exist, which which some people do claim. Actually, no, no. I. It's not that we don't exist. It's just that the that it's it's uh, it's a um, yeah. I like working model. I mean, it's just something to get us through life. Otherwise, we would you know. I mean, we we would just sort of have totally incoherent behavior but it's not it's not it's not well anyway I'm probably getting beyond where I want to go now um, so I think let's end with that uh, Mike thank you very much for thank you so much thank you everybody thank you. okay with that the conference is over, and so um, I want to thank everybody for coming to this. I think it's been a great meeting, and I've enjoyed meeting all of you. I've enjoyed hearing what you're working on, and um, I feel uh, kind of good about where science is headed after this meeting. You know, I mean, it gives me some optimism. It's not just you know, I come from this very rigid learning and memory community, and I, it's depressing to me when I go there and hear talks, same old stuff, same old, same old, and this has all been really delightful. Um, so we're not going to feed you tonight, so you're on your own. Uh, there are lots of restaurants in Westwood, and, um, you know, I can recommend some if, you're, if you, you know, have a type of food that you're interested in. And then otherwise, I just want to wish you safe travels, and I hope we, I see more of all of you. So 